Good morning, everyone. This is Deborah Crowett at John Burton Advocates for Youth. We're on our February TA call for the 2018 California Plus Youth FAFSA Challenge. And the really cool thing is if my slides will work. Uh, uh, let me mention that, you know, we really want to hear your questions and deal with what's on your mind. So we've got a few things to present, and then we want to make sure you have a chance to ask any of your questions. I want to encourage you to raise your hand if you would like, and you can use your control panel to do that, and then I can unmute you, and you can ask your question, and we can have some dialogue. But feel free also if you'd rather just write your question in the question panel, and we'll make sure we get to, hopefully, I think we'll have time to get to all of them. So, um, And remember that we will be posting the recording of this on our FAFSA Challenge webpage, so you can go back and review it or share it with anyone else that you might want to. I think today, you're going to find today really helpful because we managed to get some more great folks on the call. I'm here, Deborah Pruitt, and Melinda is here, our project consultant for communications and publicity on the FAFSA challenge. I think Debbie will be here, um, so if we have any technical questions for her. And we have Kathy White and Bridget Stump from Foster Focus at Sacramento County Office of Ed here to share, again, the um, updates that they made to Foster Focus to support the FAFSA Challenge, yay. And I'm excited to have Dolores Daniel here from the Santa Barbara County Office of Ed because she's been working within Web Grants with the reports that are available to you all once you have your account access. And so she's got some great tips and suggestions or things she learned to make them more useful. So I'm really happy she can share that with you. So the great news, everyone's in the challenge. We've got all counties participating. So we have a truly statewide FAFSA challenge. Great. Um, and then I want to turn it over to Melinda to, to share with you some of the um, new things we have going on to help in, increase um, visibility for the challenge and for your work. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, so um, to help build our Foster Youth FAFSA Challenge community, we've just created uh, a FAFSA Challenge Facebook page and Twitter account we're really excited about. Um, we had posted a, a few things on the JBay Facebook page, but now we have a, a dedicated FAFSA Challenge page. Um, so uh, we want to be sure that you you know, like our page and encourage your community partners to like our page. Um, it's a great way to uh, share resources and get inspired. Uh, next slide. So, and if you have your own um, County Office of Ed uh, Facebook pages and, and can post, just um, tag our challenge page. Uh, if you don't have your own um, page, then you can send me um, photos, um, you know, news about your events, and I will post it on our challenge page. So, uh, next slide, please. The kinds of things that it would be great to post are, you know, your news uh, about what's happening in your county, maybe uh, partnerships, um, events, photos from your events, and video clips are really great. People like video clips. <laughs> Um, tips and resources. Here's an example of. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah>. So <laughs> that's okay. Um, and and especially um, great to you know send out reminders about the March second deadline. Really remind your partners about the importance of getting the fast in by March second. Next slide. So here's an example of a great event happening at uh, that happened in LA. Uh, and we posted this on the JBay page and tagged LA County Office of Ed. And so this is great. You know, other um, uh, programs can get great ideas and see what everybody's doing. Next slide. And then we're also starting to tweet. Um, <laughs> this is all brand new. This is uh, as of yesterday, we got this going. So please uh, follow us um, and, uh, you know, join in on uh, tweeting and tagging and so forth. So um, and here's a, a, a video clip from our uh, the meeting in, in Sacramento. Um, so again, this is just a great way to share ideas and show what you're doing and, um, and uh, get inspired. So next slide, please. 
and that's our handle. So when you, you follow us on Twitter at FAFSA Challenge. Oh, and then also, yeah, let us know other, um, you know, people and places we should be following as well so that we can um, stay connected, get good, you know, share resources um, from around uh, the state and our country. Next slide. And then also, um, we're always updating the uh, resources on the JBA uh, website, the FAFSA Challenge page. Um, so if you haven't checked it out recently, we have um, uh, the FAFSA Challenge uh, Toolkit, which is a great resource. Uh, you can print it out, but it's really meant to be used online because it has a lot of great um, you know, online resources. And then when we have had webinars, we um, archive them here on the, on the website. So be sure to check that out, especially the um, January 17th and January 22nd webinars uh, really were great step-by-step, um, -step. here they are, um, walking through the FAFSA, demystifying the FAFSA uh, with particular information about helping foster youth complete the FAFSA. Okay. Thanks, Melinda. So this is Deborah again. Um, I wanted to mention that some of you um, ha may not have received your promotional materials yet, the posters and stickers and financial aid guides. And so we had to do another print on the financial aid guides. So we will be getting those out to you within the next week to two weeks, um, trying to do it as quickly as possible, of course. We know that this is the critical timing. So if you haven't gotten yours yet, they're on their way. Um, I've, Melinda already mentioned the toolkit, and I just had this here to remind us to um, remind you that it's available on the website for ideas for activities and events and ways to make sure that all the foster youth are, are um, engaged. And then the policies and procedures manual is also on that same, our same web, web page, which I wanted to again remind folks or folks who are still getting kind of on online, so to speak, <laughs> on the system that it's there and we really you know, painstakingly try to cover critical in, um, guidelines, instructions, tips, and answer the questions that we've had from folks. So um, they're, they're valuable resources. We're also adding a couple more FAQs on, on web grants and on reporting because as you all have been working, we've been hearing you and what your questions are. And so today we should have some more um, posted. I'm going to talk about a few of those things in a minute. The reporting spreadsheet is also there, which includes this um, entries and exits worksheet. This is really just a template we put in for you to use as you find useful. Um, it's not that we need to see this, and of course we never need to see um, student names or ID numbers, but um, people some counties do have a lot of ins and outs, and we wanted to just make it easy and clear, and there are clear instructions in that um, manual about how to handle those in terms of your baseline number um, and for the challenge um, calculation. And then if you'll notice, the report has um, four tabs, or five tabs, <laughs> so the entry exit worksheet I was just referring to and then also the completion report template. And you should have already filed your January 31st report. If we haven't gotten it yet, we need to get it today. Um, we realize it's early. You may not have a lot of completions, that's fine. We need this to just see that you are in the loop on the train <laughs> and that um, any comments you can add about what your status is with your web grants application, or if you're not using web grants, what sources are you using for your um, for your completion numbers? And so I wanted to highlight here that each of the reports are in this same workbook. So you can send us this now and then again March 15th, which will be the critical time to have completion numbers because that will be that's one of the deadlines for the county awards, the top. Completers by that point will be put in a drawing for those $1,000 unrestricted funds. And again, the May 31st report. And then notice it has that tab for the scholarship drawing um, entries. So at the end, in May, that's when you will give us your anonymized identified students 
um, for the drawing. So no names, no student ID numbers, but your own made up ID for those students um, that have completed the FAFSA that get included in the drawing. And now I'm going to turn it over to Foster Focus because they've done some things to help support the challenge. And I know one of the things that they included was an anonymous identifier, as I understand, right, um, for the students that you that are in the FAFSA challenge. So th this That's is uh, Kathy White and Bridget Stomper here to um, update you on what's available on Foster Focus if you're using that. Great, and I apologize for anybody who heard my spiel um, during the last TA call. Um, we're just going to go over it again because I know a lot of counties are kind of um, just ramping up kind of like we are and maybe are just um, getting ready to uh, look at tools that can help them with the challenge. So SCOE has written some tools to help support counties participating in the FAFSA challenge. We can go ahead and change a slide. Uh, we wrote a grad transition module. It's a student support tool that also includes FAFSA challenge support for counties. And we hope that just districts will use the grad transition tools when they're working with their 12th grade students as they plan their entry to college and career. Information on the grad transition tools was released a couple of weeks ago by Bridget. But it's also available in the resources section of Foster Focus if you don't have that email handy. Um, and the how-to guide kind of lays out how the whole thing works to help you uh, manage your 12th graders. Uh, the new module includes support for all stages of the FAFSA challenge. So as you're starting up and getting your list together, uh, as you're monitoring your list um, throughout the challenge, and then also for those critical reporting dates, we have tools in place um, for each part of that challenge. So using the tools does require some work. Uh, counties have to build and maintain that list of students, and they have to keep their enrollments and their FAFSA and CDAA, the DREAM Act, application submission dates um, up to date in the system. So how do you do this? Why don't you go to the next slide? So your first step would be to contact me at SCOE, uh, and I can do a little bit of setup for you guys. A lot of counties have already gone through this process with me, and what we do is we just talk about uh, the date that your county entered the challenge and which set of students you use to determine your baseline. And if you are uploading your CalPads data to Foster Focus already, I have some nice little scripts where I can help you pre-populate your population and get you started, and that can save you a lot of time. Uh, the setup process is really short and easy, so if you haven't gone through the process but would like to use the tool, uh, please do contact me, and keep in mind that you'll want to do that well ahead of your reporting deadline just so you can get a good feel for, for your population, and you can call me anytime. Once your county is set up, you can use the new tools to kind of monitor your incoming and outgoing 12th graders and continue to add students to the challenge. Um, and this is also the time where you're keeping your enrollments up to date so that we know what students should be included in the count. Um, when we get to the reporting portion, uh, you can use the tools to easily generate that reporting data uh, for John Burton. So we just went over that spreadsheet with Deborah that shows um, how to keep track of students. Well, Foster Focus can do much of that for you. And it also generates that anonymous ID uh, for the drawing. So you don't have to worry about that. So as always, Bridget Stumpf, our lead Foster Focus administrator, is available for ongoing training and support with these tools. And I can also be reached um, if you have any questions as I'm kind of managing our population for Sacramento County too and feeling the same kind of things that you guys are feeling. So with the next slide, you can see that's our contact information. So please feel free to give either of us a call and uh, we'll get you going. Thanks so much, Kathy. So you'll both be available for questions as they come up on this um, webinar, so yeah, great, thanks. So um, we're just gonna go through a couple more things um, before we go to questions, and we're watching your questions if you're posting them so that we know whether we're, we'll, 
we we're answering some of them as we come along. But I'm going to make a couple of mentions about the web grant uh, manual uh, that is available on our website that will help you. I, let me just acknowledge that I know it's been, you know, some some work for folks to get the web grant account set up. And we've been trying to be as responsive as possible to any of the questions you've had or any of the difficulties. I think most everyone has found CSAC to be extremely helpful when you do call their helpline, which is in that manual that's on our web page. Um, and, you know, it's, it's acknowledged that it's a little bit of work to set it up, but then you're in. And then I think you'll see, especially with Dolores's, um, presentation, just how valuable this information will be. So remember that for us, for the FAFSA challenge, in order to be in the challenge and for your students to actually get in the drawing, you do need to submit these three reports to us. And this web grant is going to help you to do that, um, as well as the Foster Focus um, complement, or if you are using that primarily. But there are some things that the um, web grants reports give you some information that they give you that are only available there that are kind of that follow through step to make sure the students get their full financial aid. So I'm going to touch on that again in terms of verifying that they have all their information accurate and so forth. But I'm going to um, just mention here this little diagram is in the web grants manual. It's the student summary report and the financial aid application that says no GPA that um, together give you the full complement of students who completed their FAFSA. That is what you want to report to us. But because we don't even have a web grants account, because we're not an LEA, we can't uh, know all the nuances as well as we would like. So I'm happy that Dolores is here because she's been working with the report and she's got some great tips to share with you. So Dolores, this is this is your time. Thank you, Deborah. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you're all well. Today, I'm just going to share a few things I learned while using web grants to turn in the first FAFSA challenge report on Wednesday. Uh, when I first found out that we had to search, you know, a few reports for each student in order to really get all of the information we were looking for. Um, I wasn't too excited about using the system. And then when I first logged on, it was also a little bit overwhelming to see a big list of reports and not really be familiar with it. Uh, but once I got into looking for the information, it really was pretty easy and very helpful. So I just wanted to share a few things that I sort of uncovered as I was uh, going through the process and my own personal way of uh, getting at the data. And if any of you have anything to share, what's worked for you or, or uh, any tips that you have, please share those at the end of this presentation as well. So the first thing that I wanted to go over, um, can you change the slide, please, Deborah? Do you see the Hello? menu? Is that what you need? Yes. Mm -hmm. So when you don't, uh, okay, good. No, it's, it's frozen. Uh. Are you serious? <laughs> Any okay. problems? I'll keep before. talking. I, I, for a minute, I wasn't sure if my phone cut off. That's why I was kind of like pausing. No, okay. I had switched it. So you don't see the menu yet? Yeah, yes, now we do. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. So uh, the FAFSA manual is very helpful, uh, the Web Grants manual that Jay Bay put together for us. So you have to just click on three things, uh, you know, before you get to this page that's up on the slide. So you go to Web Grants data transfer, and then report download. And all of that is in the Web Grants Manual on the FAFSA Challenge uh, resource page. So once you get to this page, uh, what I kind of did when I was looking at each uh, page, you, this is broken down by school. So you have to choose the school code. And then for every single school, you'll have one of these menus pop up. So looking from the bottom up, all those first reports that are listed, none of those are reports that you have to look at where it says the Cal Grant awardees, et cetera. Uh, I, in the Web Grants Manual, it doesn't mention anything about the GPA summary, 
but I did find that to be a helpful report as well as I found some students on that report that were not on the other reports. So uh, what I first wanted to point out was this, what's circled in red right here, the student summary report. Under media type, you'll see on the column, it says report. But if you go up about four rows, you'll see student summary report again. And then under media type, it says data file. So those are the same report because those are both student summary reports for January, but one is in a report format and one is in a data file format. And you know, in the beginning, I didn't know what the difference was between those and I didn't have a preference, but I really do think that the report format is more helpful and I wanted to show you why. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what the data file report looks like. It, it downloads just like this. Um, when you get your web grants account, you'll get an email and it'll tell you that the supported browsers are Firefox and Internet Explorer. And I'm not using those browsers. I didn't really want to download a new browser. So I'm using Chrome. I don't know if these reports will look any different or if they'll be able to be downloaded in Excel or anything like that if you're using Internet Explorer or Firefox. So if you did use one of those browsers and anything was different, please share that at the end of this presentation as well. But I was using Chrome and this is exactly what the report looked like when I downloaded it. It didn't have any headings um, and any explanation or titles on the top of the report. Whereas this exact same student summary report in the report format is much more helpful. Next slide, please. This is the same report, but as you can see, it'll put the name of the school at the top. It'll have uh, the date that you ran the report. It'll tell you what each uh, column has in it, the information. And the student summary report doesn't have a key or a long explanation, but some of the other reports have really valuable information in them. And when you down the whole report in this format, then you can copy and paste that information somewhere else and then you don't have to keep going back to web grants to to remind yourself you know what what something meant or what that report was showing you exactly it'll be right there when you reference it so uh, i found that really helpful and in the beginning i i just you know i didn't really differentiate between those two so i wanted to share that with you so um you can leave it on this slide i wanted to explain the way that i search for the students was that I, I went into each report quickly. Um, we're we're going to talk about the four different reports, and this is the student summary. So I would go into one school, and I would download one of the reports, so for instance, the student summary report, and copy the whole entire report, including the name, title at the top, and any description of the report or key at the bottom. And then I would create uh, an Excel workbook for each school. So this school right here is Carpinteria Union High School. So I had create a workbook for Carpinteria High School and then copy each report into a separate sheet in that workbook and then save the Excel spreadsheet under the name of the school and the month. So this report would be Carpinteria January report. And then when I was ready to search the students enrolled in any, um, well, enrolled in this particular school, Carpinteria High, I didn't have to search each report separately. I could just put in their name into the search function, search the whole workbook, and it would do the work for me. And I would I'd be able to hit everything all at once. So that was very helpful. Uh, I did think of one thing afterward that I didn't think of in the beginning, which was that students do change schools quite often. And I did come across one student who had transferred from another school within my county about two weeks prior. And he had self-reported that he had completed his FAFSA, but I didn't find it in the report for the school that he was currently attending. So I went back to his previous school, which thankfully was within my county, and I was able to see, yes, indeed, that he had uh, completed his FAFSA and there was a GPA verification and everything. So I may, this next, Time around, I may go ahead and see if I can fit all the schools into one workbook. And then that way I can also 
be able to search students who may have changed schools and I won't miss the information for them. Next slide, please. So this is the GPA summary report. And this is not something that's listed in the web grants manual as a report that you need to use. Uh, I was just sort of, you know, playing around with web grants and taking a look at some of the reports just to make sure that I had the right ones. And I did find a student on this report that was not in the student summary report. And I can't tell you why, but that just tells me that it's possible that there's information in this report for students who have successfully completed their FAFSAs uh, that you could miss if you're only downloading the student summary report to get this information. So uh, I would suggest that you also include this in the reports that you download. Uh, additionally, this report, and I, I think um, a few of the other ones, does not list the students by name. So the benefit of having all of these reports in one place is that you can go and you can search by name quickly, and then if the student doesn't come up that way, then you can put into the same um, search field, you can put their SSID. And you don't have to worry about figuring out which report you're searching. You know you're going to be hitting one or the other that way per student as you go through your list to, to try to find out um, who has submitted their FAFSAs. So it went by really quickly. I, I did have a staff member help me and just sort of read the list of names and give me the SSIDs because I didn't want to go back and forth between you know, a bunch of documents. Um, and so we were able to get through the list pretty quickly and confidently. And I found students who had completed their FAFSA and had had their GPA verified. I found students that had completed their FAFSA that had not yet had their GPA verified. And, and then I found a few students that were listed as not having turned in their FAFSA and then there's students that just didn't come up on any of the lists. So um, before I, I go on to the next slide, this one does have a, a column where it mentions that there's no EFC. So I didn't come across any students who had submitted their FAFSAs and had that comment on there. But I like the fact that Web Grants gives us this ability to show students who you know, for all practical purposes would feel like they were done with the whole process and even their counselors might think they were done with the process, GPA had been submitted, and yet there is something wrong with their FAFSA. And the fact that we can see that, we can make contact with the counselor and student and go back and figure out what the problem is, um, gives me a lot of confidence using this system to get at that information firsthand. Next slide, please. Dolores, before I go to the next mm -hmm. slide, can I put an exclamation point on this and, and an explanation? So um, for those who aren't clear on what ESC means and why it's so important, I think this is the chance to really explain that. That stands for Expected Family Contribution. And that is what the Financial Aid Commission calculates based on the information in the FAFSA. And so if a student does not have an ESC, they cannot get a financial aid award. So the sooner that's caught, the sooner their calculation is made and the sooner they get, you know, figured into the financial aid packages. So not having an ESC, for instance, could mean even if the student submitted a FAFSA in time to qualify for a needs-based Cal grant, they won't get one. Um, they won't qualify for some of the other, if it waits until they get to the college financial aid office to get that cleaned up, they may miss out on other financial aid. So this is one of the power, this is part of the power you have with Web Grants Report to be able to help coach your school staff, your district staff on the follow through for seniors that um, they don't have parents to do for them to make sure that all of their information is accurate and completed. So Web Grants is showing you that in this case. So I'm so glad you highlighted that, um, Dolores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, sorry. Go yeah, no, it's fine, because not everyone has worked with ESC before, so it's not always clear what that is, but it's one of the most important things that, um, that needs to happen after the FAFSA is submitted, is double checking that the ESC is calculated. 
So uh, this is what the financial application no GTA report looks like. This is actually the bottom of the report. It looks a little bit different at the top, but I wanted to give you an example again of that report format and how much information it gives you. You saw on the one we just looked at, that was the top of the report and there was a description of the report. And here, this one gives a description at the bottom. It gives you a key. It, it mentions EFC flags right there. Um, so it, it's just really helpful to have this, like I said, pasted into the Excel worksheet or whatever, you know, you could potentially use Word to do the same thing. Um, so I did find students, like I said, if one student has turned in their financial aid application, for some reason, it's not necessarily going to show up on all of the reports. It could show up um, on one report, even though they haven't submitted a GPA yet. Um, but not on this particular report. So I do think it, it really is important to check all of these reports. And again, that's why finding a way to do that all at once where you don't have to search each student separately is really helpful because it, it's a little bit hit and miss. Um, another thing is that we had some students who were reported to have completed their FAFSAs and it was reported by staff who had assisted them in a workshop on campus. And for whatever reason, we haven't seen those students show up in these reports yet. And it was a few weeks back. Um, whereas there were also students that we hadn't been able to get in touch with or totally confirm what their status was. And they did show up on these reports. So uh, what we're gonna do, you know, we're gonna go back and check in with those staff members and really make sure that those students create a web grants account for themselves and go look and see you know what what that account is telling them because they're not showing up on our reports and even the staff at their school who assisted them believe that they have submitted a fafsa uh, i don't know yet how long it takes for the results to show up for these things to be uploaded i know that we also had a workshop on january 29th and i looked through all these reports on the 31st to make sure that we had the most recent data and those weren't on there yet, but that, that was only two days. But as I said, some of those other students reported weeks before the 31st that they had completed their FAFSA, and we haven't seen that come through. So, um, so I'll be checking the uh, reports regularly, but also following up with them to have them check their web grants account. Yeah, so good. Dolores, let me just say, your voice is starting to cut in and out. I'm not sure if it's happening to anyone else, but um, but if you can maybe shift your phone some way or another, maybe that's just a bad um, connection. And I think that, okay. that we should point out to, um, that it generally is about a two-week delay with the information being uploaded. So the FAFSA submission, you know, goes to the federal um, uh, aid commission and then comes to Cal Grants. So it will take, you know, maybe a week to two weeks, probably two weeks mm -hmm. for that information. Okay, do you want okay. you said change slides? Okay. Sure. So this is uh, the unmatched report. So the I'm not gonna go into detail on this because the web grants manual does go into more detail, but basically these are students who either have not submitted a financial aid application or they have not been matched to one, or there's a partial match. Um, and the manual explains that most likely students, if it's just first and last name, it, it's most likely not the student that um, is attending this school that necessarily turned in that FAFSA. It, the, the system is trying to, to match with the first name and last name, but there's no social security number to match it to. And so this is just kind of giving you a heads up that there's a partial match. But if you see on those match fields, you see things like date of birth, uh, first name, address, for instance, that gives you a hint that it, it is likely that a student potentially turned in an, an application and they had you know, a slight variation in their last name, maybe there was a hyphen or no hyphen, something that's causing a mismatch there. And then you would wanna go back and check in with that student. That didn't happen to, to any of our students, um, but again, if you want more explanation on this report, you can refer to the Web Grants Manual and it goes into detail. Um, so I did download this report for every school included in the workbook and um, a few names popped up 
but they, they didn't appear to be um, students that, that we were looking for. So last slide, please. So to go over just a, a quick summary, although the GPA summary report is not listed on the Web Grants Manual, I did find at least one student on that list. So please use that report as well as the other ones. And that report does not use names, only SSID, whereas the student summary report does not show the SSID, it only shows the name. So you have to be able to search students both ways in order to catch all of the students on your list. Um, when you download a report, at least on my end, it, it downloads in a text file, so it makes it a little bit hard to work with. So one of the tips you can use is to utilize Excel, um, put it all into one workbook, and then use the search function to go really quickly and find those students. So um, in closing, I just want to say that I, I did find this really useful. Um, I'm going to follow up with the schools and on the students that did show up with no GPAs matched. And I imagine that even closer to the end of, um, you know, well, as we get closer to March 2nd, that's going to be even that much more important. And schools have a lot of students to look for, you know, a lot of students to, to update on. And I, I just feel fortunate that we'll be able to look out for, for these students. Some of them might be, you know, turning in their FAFSAs close to the wire at the end. And to be able to look and see that they have completed the FAFSA, to go a little deeper with the schools um, because we have this information and we, we can follow up and let them know either that there's an error, that there's no EFC, um, ask about the GPA verification, things like that. I, I feel like it's going to um, just help us kind of, you know, solidify that relationship even more with the schools as we offer this kind of support and help them track these students. So it was a good experience for me uh, once I figured out a way to get through all of this information and I'm definitely going to be using it along the way. It's a lot easier than trying to get this information from um, people sometimes, you know, <laughs> kind of have it there. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of students, there's a lot of movement. And of course, we're, we're in there, we're doing workshops, we're, we're talking to counselors, um, but it, it's nice to have this backup and, and to know that this is what's in the system. So. Thank you very much, Deborah, for letting me share Thanks, that. Thanks, Dolores. That was so helpful. And and I just think I, I really appreciate what you're saying about this being sort of a chance to go to the counselors or to the liaisons with some, some information and assistance for them rather than just asking them to do something. Um, also, I want to just highlight that sometimes you may have students who show up who think they've submitted a FAFSA, and maybe they did complete it, but they didn't sign it and submit it. So they might have put the information in, but they didn't, this happens a lot, they just don't hit submit or they don't do the signature piece. So just a tip on that. And then I wanted to highlight again the um, CSAC Web Grants Assistance, and you would be calling the institutional support, and they're extremely helpful, and they really are excited about the FAFSA challenge, so I think they're, they're there for you. I want to touch on a few um, sort of frequently asked questions, and I've seen a few of those come in today, so hopefully I will be addressing most of those, but let me know if we don't cover it. So just, I think Dolores just said it, um, the first question, sort of, if, if somebody else has access to the web grants, why do I need to go through all this hassle, you know, filling in the form and getting high school codes to get my own account? Well, you see why. I think Dolores said it better than I can. Um, then, Questions have come up about non-accredited schools. They will not have um, GPA. They can't upload um, their GPA um, to Cal Grants, or to, sorry, to, to CFACs or Web Grants. So what happens to those students? Well, to qualify for Cal Grant, they would need to take a test such as the GED, the SAT, HITET, or, or TASD. And then they can submit that test score to CFAC and they convert it in the way that they need to and include that for that student file, okay? We've had questions about, um, oh, we just answered, I think, the question about the EFC. If we send a list of students, oh, can you send a list of students who still have not completed their FAFSA or who do not have an EFC or maybe their GPA verification is in the end to the foster youth counselors? Yes, that's part of the function 
of supporting education for these youth so you can provide that information to your schools, to your counselors, to your liaisons. Um, what to do about seniors who are not on track to graduate this year? The fifth year senior question. Well, they remain in your baseline number because they are showing up as a senior in your CalPads. And they, um, and, and so then we're urging everyone to go ahead and help them complete a FAFSA. I think Dolores had said she'd done that with some, or someone was telling me that. I talked to several people the last couple of days. You know, it helps them see what might be available to them, demystifies the process, shows that they're really um, important enough to go to college can really make a difference, make it easier for them to apply the following year when they really are ready to graduate. So if you do that, then they will show up as having completed a FAFSA, so they're in your baseline and they're in your completion number in terms of the challenge itself. Then the question comes up, I've got a few students who are in a special ed program, they'll be earning a certificate of, of completion, not a diploma. We know that you have to have a high school diploma to qualify for federal financial aid. But they should still, comp if, if there are a couple of options, okay? So if you think they're likely to benefit from a career education program at a community college, then they should complete the FAFSA. They still would qualify for a Chafee grant. A lot of folks don't realize you don't have to have a high school diploma for a Chafee grant. And then we've also provided some more information on the FAQ that we're going to post today about special programs for youth who are in special certain special education programs and um, there's it's too complicated to go into now but there are some programs where they can qualify for financial aid so i urge you to look for that um, on our on our fafsa challenge web page and then the question we've gotten from some folks is they've gotten a login but can't access the account because some schools have not signed a program agreement form or maybe you just get this sort of block that you can't log in so what's happened is that some high schools don't have a program agreement form signed with CSAC and that means that CSAC can't provide the report with their data to you so I put the details here you kind of have two choices you can um, for the expediency, you can delete those schools from your application for an account. They'll approve your account without those schools, but then you'll be missing them. So the task is then to get the schools to sign those agreements, so then you can reapply with those schools and you'll have access to all of them, like Dolores just showed in her case. And we're suggesting that you triage. If you find out that you have 10 high schools who don't have agreement signs, but maybe there are only three that really have foster youth, then obviously those are the ones to bring, you know, ask to sign the agreements and um, and and get them on your your account. It may be in some cases that it's the district administrator that signs that agreement for the high school, but in many cases it's the high school itself. And CSAC is um, definitely willing to help if you contact them and ask them what the problem is, and um, they'll let you know which are those schools that don't have um, agreement signed. And we're helping out with that as much as we can as well. So I'm going to go to questions and see if anyone has their hand raised, which I don't see. So I'm hoping um, that I've answered the question about fifth-year seniors. Um, and Sheila's saying she wants to thank Dolores very much for the review on the web grants report. It was extremely helpful for understanding them. I had a feeling that would be the case. It was really, really clarifying, Dolores. And, you know, we don't, I don't have access to web grants, so I found it helpful. I could understand it without ever having looked at web grants. So <laughs> I'm sure it's helpful for all the rest of you. Yeah. And I, I haven't, you know, been working on it that long, but I would still be happy to go over anything with people who have questions if it, if it comes up, you know, anybody can give me a call, especially if you're just barely logging on, um, you know, I'm available. Okay. So Sandra's got your hand up. I'm going to um, see if I can get how to. I need to. So, Sandra, you have a question about the um, information for students without a diploma? 
Maybe Sandra's not there. So I'll answer that again. The um, I found two different options. One is for any student without a diploma that can actually earn, may, may be able to earn a diploma, they can join a very particular type of program that's authorized to um, help them earn their diploma while completing a career program. They can qualify for financial aid. The other is um, certain programs that are for students with disabilities that also qualify under federal financial aid. And that information is written up. It's, it's you know, I've got links to the web pages that you can use to find where these programs are and so forth. And it's in the FAQ that we're posting on our web page today, later this afternoon. And it says, um, it's on the reporting FAQ, I believe. Now, Melinda, if you can remember that, let me know. <laughs> We've got two, one for web grants and one for reporting. So we're posting those this afternoon. Um, any other questions that we haven't answered? Hi, Deborah. There were two questions I think that were remaining. I saw this is Jessica. Um, one, someone was asking about the time frame of when they need to get their web grants account set up. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Someone wanted to know the time frame of when they need oh. to get their web grants account set up. So they're fairly quick with the initial application when all of the information is complete. I know a lot of folks have gotten their account within a couple of days or a week at the most, um, sometimes maybe a little longer if they're super busy. I think in some cases, there may have been an issue with some of the high school, um, the high school report uh, agreements not being signed. So I would say if you don't have a response from CSAC within four or five days, I would call them and find out. And Deborah, this is Melinda. I would add that um, <clears throat> you can email the form uh, to Adrian Slade. His email address is in the um, Web Grants Manual. But um, on the actual form that you complete, there's a, you know, USPS address. There's a physical address to mail it to. So some people, we've heard some people have mailed it, and then, you know, haven't gotten a word for a while. So um, it's it's great if you can just email a copy to Adrian Slade. And I can put his email address again in the email we send out after today. Great, thanks. Dolores, <clears throat> I have a question for your phone number. Uh -huh. Oh, it's um, 805-964-4710, extension 4415. Thank you. And uh, about the application, I emailed mine, and I got my login information in two days. I was really surprised by that. And okay. also, when you're doing the form, if you have a lot of schools, if you go by district, which is kind of intuitive, but for some reason, I didn't start off that way. If you fill out the form and you're, you're looking for the codes and you go by district, the districts, the schools within each district have very similar codes. They're just like one digit off. So it's mm -hmm. easier to to enter the codes that way if you put them in order by district. So that was something else I noticed. If you're still working right. on your form. Thanks. Jessica, were there any other questions that we didn't get yet? Yes, there was one for foster focus. It okay, says right. report 105P and foster focus does not currently reflect the students enrolled in my county. Can the download to Excel feature be added to the report screen so that I may filter out the students who are not currently enrolled in my county. So I think the best uh, way to troubleshoot this is to just go ahead and call me. Um, what's happened in the past is that the setup process was not completed and then when people go to use the report, it's not reflecting the accurate data. So I'd wanna get on the phone with that person and make sure that we've done um, all the steps 
in order so that everything looks good. So my contact information, you can call me at 916-228-2754. Can you say that again? Somebody might not have been ready to write it down. My phone number? Yeah, it's 916-228-2754. Thank you. I was going to go back to the slide where it's on there, but I'm afraid that it'll crash the system if I move around that way. <laughs> Any other questions that we haven't answered? Sounds good. You know, I want to acknowledge you all because you're doing such amazing work. You've taken this on. You were, you know, it's extra um, for bureaucratic procedures to get the account with web grants set up and all of that. And, and we know, you know, that's, that's taken some time, but I was, I was happy to hear Dolores has found it really helpful and others of you have said the same. And I want to thank you all for the um, emails and calls that we've been getting, asking questions. It's, it's helping us identify the things that need to be addressed. Um, you know, we've been able to troubleshoot, solve some things, and certainly generate some of the information and answers that you all need. So, and, and the good news is, you know, web grants, if, if those, you might remember if you were at our November meeting in Sacramento, CSAC is working on revamping their entire web grant system. And so, um, you're kind of going through the labor pains right now, but, you know, in about 2020, they're supposed to have a new system out, which will be a lot more friendly. And, and helpful and, and easy to use. So um, that's good news coming along. But in the meantime, you've got access to this, to this information once, you, once you're in. So I think we're, sounds like we're done. Anything, um, last moment questions? I can see some thank yous, thank you. <laughs> um, very good. I think that's great then. Thank you all. Don't hesitate to email and call us if we can be of any help. And uh, have fun with the events and things that you're doing with the students. See you on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> Bye.